Hello everyone and how's it going? Welcome back to my channel for those who are returning viewers and for those who are new, thank you for dropping by. I hope you're gonna like what you see. So I really hope that every single one of you had an amazing run with Palantir in the market. And if you're searching about Palantir and have decided to click on my video, then chances are you're asking yourself the one question that so many of us are asking. Should you get into Palantir now? So as we know, over the past few years, the job market has been pretty rough and very uncertain for many people. The inflation, on the other hand, has been eating away the savings that you managed to put away, if any, in countries that used to be deflationary for decades. When every source of certainty is about to whittle away, we must take this opportunity to take a step back and to remember that we need to take our own financial independence and well-being into our own hands. So in order to secure this, we have to find the opportunities of tomorrow and probably of today and seize the ones that can multiply our capital significantly, increasing the money available for investment later. So essentially, we need to find a golden goose. And for many, Palantir is one of those. Over the past few years, Palantir became so much more than just another tech company promising on great market shares or great outlooks of a certain sector in exchange of money from the investors. So it is a major company that is playing the role of the canary down a coal mine and also one of the signals for the market bouncing back. It has enough clout and mystery around it to arouse the market's curiosity and people's tendency to follow the trend. It is a company that people would often view pretty much equally as the risk um, indicator of the market alongside others like Tesla or Apple. The fact that Palantir may rise and fall with the tidal waves of risk capital is a pretty useful prediction tool for many. And this is what makes it pretty useful or at least not unuseful to follow in the market. And in this video, we're going to take a deep dive into Palantir and see whether it deserves to have a place in your portfolio. Before the video continues, I just want to take a moment to thank you for coming by to my channel and to hope that you will enjoy your stay and to take something away from my content. If you like what you see, please consider to like, subscribe and to check out my channel for playlists of other companies that I cover. That being said, let's continue with Palantir. So Palantir Technologies has been experiencing some significant price movements as of late. So over the past few trading sessions, you know, the stock has seen a high of around $23 and a low of like $22.50. The movements from previous trading sessions absolutely indicated a certain level of volatility within the market, especially with the downward pressure. As the expectation has been steadily building up over the past few weeks and month, as the price had a hard time moving up while the move while like the volume continues to drop below the average. Right now, Palantir is showing more signs of stabilization. And in the short term, we have identified a resistance level of around $25, which the stock has struggled to like maintain and let alone surpass. And a support level around $23. And below that, we also have the $20 as a much harder support level providing more stability to its price movements. These levels serve as important markets for investors, indicating potential areas of price reversal or continuation. The short-term trends for Palantir stock appears to be moving sideways with a slight downward tendency. This trend can be attributed to a decrease in both interest and volume from investors. While the overall trend remains bullish, the weakening momentum suggests a potential shift in the market sentiment. Now, in terms of volume, like the stock seems to be at a trading volume ranging from like 25 to 30 million shares a day. And the average is around 50 to 70 million shares. Um, 
this data suggests that we have been seeing like a pretty steady decline in volume and what comes with it is the interest from the retail investors. So Plantier is currently experiencing a period of continuous weakening, uh, despite like many efforts of maintaining a bullish trend overall, which in fact hasn't been broken yet. But we can definitely see that the like the the stock is long due for some sort of um, for some sort of pullback and of profit taking, allowing us to take a breath and to think about where do we want to go next. So the short term price movement indicates a sideways pattern with a slight downward tendency, influenced by a decreasing interest and the volume from investors. So. The stock faces a lot of resistance at $25 and finds support at around 23 or sometimes 22 These levels may fluctuate as the market conditions evolve. So investors should carefully monitor those uh, tendencies and to make a decision at least about the entry point. So the recent price action shows a weakness that is probably the result of profit taking um, you know, the absence of any significant catalysts and in the void of which comes all sorts of suspicions, uh, rumors, or little stories here and there that will eventually, you know, fill the void with noise. But Palantir has been a stock of significant interest since its initial public offering IPO. Ever since its debut in the secondary market, the sentiment has been very how can I put it sensitive? Like when it's positive, it's overwhelmingly like it's overwhelmingly bullish. And when it's not, it's really bearish, like across the board, across the line, day in, day out. With investors eager to capitalize on the company's innovative data analytics technology, or with like news anchors uh, eager to break the bad news. To, to their viewers, really. So of course, Plenty's journey in the stock market has been very rocky and bumpy at best, by intermittent periods of um, bullish enthusiasm followed by prolonged periods of sell-offs, dipping at one point below the $10 mark. And if you were there, you know. Back then, when Plenty was trading around $8, nobody wanted to buy it, okay? We were having like a few million uh, shares traded every single day, and very few major like news source was talking about Palantir positively. In fact, hardly anyone was talking about Palantir at all. So, and by the way, just for a uh, a little story, I bought Palantir around that period of time. And I sold it right before it took off from like $15 all the way to 25 So yes, I missed quite a chunk of the bullish run. But um, it doesn't really like put the fun my fundamental logic into question, which is this. Um, from a fundamental perspective, it's a solid company, right? It's a pretty solid company with uh, great financials, with with its head at where it's supposed to be. So this is what's most important and by far the most important. Now, whatever that comes after is just market talk, okay? And in the context that Palantir was trading below $8, I thought that this was, if any, a good moment uh, to get in. Just because Below that, I think that any sort of bad news would have been like expressed. So there's no real point of continuously being like being bearish towards Palantir. And soon enough, I was kind of right because the price bounced back or at least stopped falling. And then when it reached, you know, $15, it was there for quite a while. And there was no news from AI at the time. And this was my cue to leave, perhaps, with some somewhat of an expectation to eventually come back at a later date. So 
Another factor that can influence Palantir's future performance is its status as a large cap, because the market capitalization uh, does play a role in whether your company is going to be picked up by a by like an institutional portfolio. Very often, a lot of companies when they choose um, like holdings to be included into their ETFs or mutual funds, they're going to see whether like your company is a mid cap or a large cap. If your company is a small cap, then chances are a lot of ETF don't want to touch uh, these entities because you don't know where it's going to pan out. You don't know what kind of weird logic those companies may follow, so on and so forth. So with Palantir, it's not that. And the fact that it's a large cap does place it on a lot of companies' radars. And in fact, speaking of like institutional investors, Plantier is one of those without too many institutional backing, which is both a good and bad thing. The good thing is it gives us, the retail investors, an opportunity um, to benefit from an entity and to benefit from a company that can truly have the potential of growing in the years and the decades to come. But the less glorious part is we have to scratch that part of our head by saying, yeah, but, you know, is there any sort of explanation that can that can justify this absence of institutional investors? Like, I think it's around 40-45%. But this is not the case for a lot of other companies, right? Such as Pepsi, Coca-Cola, Apple, um, Tesla, or... I had another company on the top of my head, which I just forgot. Oh, yeah, Lucid. Do you guys remember Lucid? Yeah, it's it's not doing too hot at the moment. But what we also know is that, um, like, Palantir's institutional ownership is like 40-45%, but Lucid is around like 70-something percent, you know? Which is why... Um, we still have a lot of room to go up, in my humble opinion. Like, I think the institutionals, they're just waiting for, um, they're just waiting for their timing to start entering into more Palantir shares. So, with that being said, um, I want to, I just want to touch base on why people may like Palantir. Because investing in a company like this presents its own opportunities and challenges uh, for the traders who are seeking like exposure in a tech field in a tech industry that's no longer like brand new but still on its growth phase especially in the realm of data analytics it's kind of rare to come by a like a legit data analytics who has legit clients who makes real money and who offers you a guarantee that there won't be any significant dilution. All of these characters, while being listed on the world's deepest capital pool, which is the U.S. stock market. So all these reasons are why, you know, Palantir draws people to it. And it has positioned itself as a leading player in the data analytics sector. You know, like it's been around for a long time. Uh, they look pretty serious. If you take, uh, if you visit their website, you can see that yes, they have quite a few products. They all seem both relatively straightforward, easy to use if you're tech savvy, and also at the same time, it has this groundedness. If you don't know what I'm saying, it doesn't have the fluff that usually comes with the Silicon Valley crowd, which is you know which can be explained easily by the fact that Palantir no longer has its headquarter in uh, the Silicon Valley. Nowadays, it is mostly located in Denver, Colorado. And that's where it's probably going to stay. And for like a while back, I remember taking a look at their their job postings. A lot of them are actually in D.C. Now, what does that actually tell you, right? They, they want to lobby the public contracts. So these are its characteristics. 
Now, some may view it as a positive point. I just view it as something that sets Palantir apart without necessarily delving into whether it's a good or bad thing, because it could be both or neither of them. Okay, but for now, let's just say that this would be one of the reasons why Palantir should be on your shortlist. It's a special company with a relatively long story in development. It's a it's a company that took many years in making. And it, like I would say that its relationships are certainly not just commercial. Because if you're a purely commercial company, then chances are like the Department of Defense and the, De the, the Department of Justice will not just start writing the checks like that, right? Uh, chances are they will have to trust you. You have to be a known, a known quality, uh, a known quantity within the industry and within this little circle. So this is why Palantir has gathered a pretty controversial reputation on top of being like, your number crunching guy. Uh, for example, they work with ICE, they work with the army, they work with, you know, health providers like NHS. Uh, they also work with some of the world's biggest corporations. And generally speaking, and this, this is where we're gonna come in, actually, we're gonna go into like, um, what tracks them down in a, in a bit. But right now, let's just say that because of those relationships, because of those long term, um, you know, prosperous relationships, I guess, um, Palantir has had almost no problem with cash flows. And this is something that a lot of like tech companies are struggling with. They need cash, they have promises. So they would usually keep diluting their shareholders by promising more and more, um, you know, rosy futures. But Palantir hasn't really promised that much. If we think about it, it has worked really hard to develop those platforms. And then when times are good, um, they don't necessarily say more than when times were bad. And in the meantime, their cash flows became positive. So that's one of the main reasons, you know, their cash flows became positive. You don't have to worry about uh, the CEO saying, oh, in order to continue our mission to save humanity, please give us another billion and please let us like dilute your holdings by like another 30%, right? So that didn't happen, fortunately so, for everyone involved. And then the other thing is because we kind of, want to believe in this AI narrative that Palantir has, you know, has decided to surf on. And this is where we have the transition into like, the potential downsides of Palantir. Essentially, if, if you think about it, like, Palantir is a data analysis firm, right? And more importantly, it's a firm that Non, it's not everyone would agree that they're doing the greater good, that they're providing a net positive outcome to the rest of the society. We've just not caught on to this new reality just yet. It doesn't mean that it's, it's not there, right? So we have to keep that in mind. And the other thing is, um, like, right now, we believe that AI is going to be here forever and that Palantir is absolutely amazing. Uh, and you know what? It's also going to, it's also going to be there. It's also going to be uh, able to collect the dividends, if you will, on this developing trend. But what if it's not true? What if two years from now, actually one year from now, um, people start to like bounce off from, from this field in particular, right? Will we see? Will we still see like as many people going into Palantir as we see now? That's a very interesting question, but I'm not sure that the market, especially the investors with vested interest into the market shares of Palantir, especially especially if you go in now, this is necessarily what you want to hear, 
Because, you know, essentially, do you want to finance your own big brother? Right? Do you want to finance a privatized portion of MI5, MI6, and CIA? If the answer is, oh, hold on, wait, wait a second, is that what they do? You know, do, do they participate in, uh, in making drones smarter? Like, if you start asking yourself those questions, and by the way, I don't necessarily take a position here, but you have to understand, right now, the market doesn't necessarily think that way, right? If they start thinking that way, then what? If they start to realize that, oh, this, like, is there any significant uh, difference between what Palantir does and what Cambridge Analytica does? The answer is, of course, yeah, of course, there there is difference. Um, is it a difference in nature? Like, is it a difference in nature? Or is it just a difference in shades of gray? And if we're starting to, to think in this manner, I feel like we're already kind of, you know, kind of shifted the narrative by then. And I'm not so sure that your, your Wall Street bets bros, your Tom Nash, um, your, your typical like YouTuber, myself included, we want to keep promoting Palantir. You know, I have to be real here. What are the odds that uh, in a few years, the wind changes its direction, we have to stop promoting Palantir because they have a very bad street rep. So those are absolutely the considerations that one must have when buying more uh, Palantir shares, or if you want to have a Palantir position to begin. So right now, the global markets are facing a complex interplay of factors that have the potential to significantly influence the equities worldwide. In this speculative analysis, I believe that the consequences of the global inflation, surging commodity prices, and decline quantitative easing, as well as the rise of inflation rates or interest rates, plus the geopolitical instabilities, are going to play a significant part. The increasing inflation rate has been putting pressures across the globe, threatening the purchasing power raising the input costs and impacting corporate profitability. Companies operating internationally may face challenges in managing rising production costs and also to sustain profit margins. Those dynamics could trigger market volatility as investors adjust their risk return expectations. The upward trajectory of commodity prices, including energy, metals, agricultural products, have been having far-reaching implications for various sectors of the global equities market. The companies heavily dependent on these commodities may experience squeezed profit margins, potentially affecting stock valuations and investor sentiment. The reduction or the end of QE's quantitative easing measures by the central banks worldwide may have resulted in reduced market liquidity. So this in turn could lead to higher borrowing costs for companies seeking capital, which may also discourage investment activities or will. The elevated market volatility plus the reduced investors' appetite may also continue to occur. Now, the central banks around the world are tackling this delicate situation of balancing the inflation rates with the economic stability and, if possible, growth. Central banks opted for aggressive interest rate hikes to combat inflation. Borrowing costs for companies have been rising, which has also slowed down business activities and also fueling the market's volatility in terms of the equity prices. Now, ongoing geopolitical tensions, including trade disputes, political uncertainties and social unrests will inject an additional element of volatility into the global markets. Investors may adopt a cautious approach, shifting towards safer assets, impacting the equities. Additionally, the escalating conflicts may disrupt supply chains, 
negatively impacting the performance of international companies. Given the interconnectedness of global markets, the aforementioned factors have reverberating effects on the U.S. equities market. Companies with significant exposure to international market may face a lot of headwinds resulting from the economic slowdowns, disrupting the supply chains and the currency fluctuations. But nevertheless, the U.S. market is known for its resilience and the diverse sectors may attract investors seeking safe havens. So really, the current landscape is characterized by global inflation, surging commodity prices, surging commodity prices, reduced quantitative easing, rising central bank inflation rates, geopolitical instabilities, and also ongoing lack of certainty regarding growth. While the U.S. market may exhibit relative strength due to the safe haven status, it's going to remain interconnected with the global economic landscape. For long-term investors, these conditions may offer opportunities to identify undervalued companies with strong fundamentals and international diversification. With that being said, short-term trades should be approached with caution because of the increased volatility and uncertainty. And also, we should be careful when assessing individual companies, sectors, or regions. All right, so with that being said, you know, overall, we've talked about Palantir as a company, the field that Palantir is in, the time that we are currently located in as well. Um, stuff like, you know, the, the different kinds of considerations of any strata of potential investors. Um, do they want to flee with their capital? Do they want to grow their capital? Do we want to safe keep their capital in a relatively stable financial market and so on? And if they do, what's going to happen with the interest rates? So all these would influence whether you want to buy plenty or not. Personally, I do believe that despite the uncertainties ahead, there's a higher chance for plenty to grow in years to come than the other way around than like them being engulfed into a major scandal and having to close shop. Like, I, I think that um, the the potential for Palantir to become even more significant in the years to come, that they're going to quietly start to shift from a mostly uh, public sector vibe to like a private, mostly private sector business model is possible. In fact, this is one of their goals that they've been saying that they're going to do. And the other thing is, like, regarding the uncertainties in the world, the uncertainties about how the market will react to, um, to Palantir's reputation, I would say that for a lot of those, the market may have already priced in um, the reputation of Palantir. We have already priced in the poten like the possibility of a recession because even back in 2019 a lot of people were saying you know what 2020 okay really have to be careful about our budget so if that were the case then it means that these you know elements have already been priced in in the plenty's price action i think the one thing that we truly don't know is whether plenty will be able to continue surfing on the AI trend? Or is that trend even surfable in the years to come? That would be the real question that'll, de that'll um, determine how much you want to buy in the Palantir. Now, to answer the question, you know, whether you should have Palantir shares, period, overall, across like, you know, multiple months or multiple years, the answer would be, I believe so. Yes, I think that it's a good idea to have some exposure in the Palantir and that, um, you know, having a 5 to 8% holding of your portfolio in that stock would be a decent choice to place your money into. And even if in a few years it's not as large as, as it is, you know, in the realms of investment, I would say that 
this is a relatively probable event to occur. Relatively, of course. There's no certainty in the market, and you definitely have to look at your own risk profile to determine how much you want to put in the pull into your I said 5 to 8%. Maybe for you, it's 2 to 3%, right? My position in Palantir, when I had it, was definitely around 0.1 to 